Assalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh and good evening. Welcome to the Primetime Asia. And tonight we will bring you some of Asia Pacific's latest string of events starting with scene at the morning of Singapore's late founding father, Lee Kuan Yew. And in West Asia, the cats are urged to end the decades-long struggle against Turkish government. Back in the Far East, China is encouraged to address governance, corruption, environmental issues to help contribute to global prosperity, while the U.S. and South Korea display the military might in a joint military drill as part of the annual Fall Eagle exercise. We also bring you news from Pakistan. And here, City Hajar Haji Muhammad Mahadir with reports. Singapore mourns the death of longtime leader Lee Kuan Yew, who died earlier this week at the age of 91. Effusive tributes flown in from world leaders, including U.S. President Barack Obama, Chinese President Xi Jinping, and Indian Prime Minister Narendra Modi. Singapore's Prime Minister Lee Hsien Long addressed the nation to announce the death of their late father, the country's first Prime Minister and the founding father of modern Singapore. He also paid tribute to Lee's contributions and spoke of his dedication to the country. The elder Lee, who is also the father of the current Prime Minister, had been hospitalised since early February with pneumonia. The senior Lee, who led the country from 1959 until 1990, is an iconic political figure in Asia. He was widely credited with transforming Singapore to become a financial powerhouse with one of the highest income per capita in the world. Although Lee Kuan Yew had receded from the public and political scene in his later years, he is still seen as an influential figure for the current government. His son has been Prime Minister since 2004. In Afghanistan, thousands of people have marched through the streets of the capital, Kabul, demanding justice for a woman who was beaten to death by a mob after being falsely accused of burning a Quran. Men and women of all ages carried banners bearing the bloodied face of Fakrunda, a 27-year-old religious scholar killed last week by a mob. Fakrunda, who, like many Afghans, went by one name, was beaten, run over with a car and burned before her body was thrown into the Kabul River. Organisers of the march estimated that 3,000 people took part, calling it one of the biggest demonstrations in Kabul's history. Police say 18 people have been arrested and 13 police officers have been suspended as part of the investigation. China's State Councillor and Special Representative Mr Yang Jiechi this week met Indian Prime Minister Mr Narendra Modi in New Delhi, a day after top officials from the two countries concluded the 18th round of border talks. The two neighbours have grown closer in recent years, although their ties remain overshadowed by a territorial dispute and the legacy of a brief but bloody 1962 border war. The Indian Foreign Ministry said in a statement that the two sides emphasise commitment to the three-step process to seek a fair, reasonable and mutually acceptable resolution of the border question at an early date. Jailed Kurdish rebel leader Abdullah Ocalan has called on the Kurds to hold a historic congress to end a decades-long armed struggle against the Turkish state that has claimed tens of thousands of lives. In an eagerly anticipated message for the traditional Kurdish New Year, Ocalan stopped short of setting out a clear roadmap for disarmament of the Kurdistan Workers' Party, PKK rebels, as had been anticipated in some quarters. In the message read out by a pro-Kurdish lawmaker to hundreds of thousands of supporters in the southeastern city of Diyarbakir, Ocalan said that the armed struggle had been painful and could no longer be maintained. Scenes that would have been unimaginable a decade ago are now broadcasted live on Turkish television where hundreds of thousands attended the New Ross New Year celebration in Diyarbakir, hearing speeches in Turkish and Kurdish. The ruling Justice and Development Party, AKP, co-founded by President Recep Tayyip Erdogan, has worked over recent years to find a solution to end the violence, granting modest reforms to the Kurdish minority. 
The head of the International Monetary Fund, IMF, Christine Lagarde, told Chinese economists that despite posting lower than expected growth, the world's second largest economy can still contribute to global prosperity. Speaking at the opening of the China Development Forum in Beijing, Mrs. Lagarde encouraged China's central government to address governance and corruption issues, as well as tackling environmental problems such as air pollution. She added that the future of China's economy and the future of the global economy were closely connected. China's Vice Premier Zhang Guoli also addressed the forum. He agreed with Lagarde regarding his country's role in tackling environmental concerns, saying green development and circular development are the paths we should take. Mr. Zhang used his speech to push the China-backed Asia Infrastructure Investment Bank AIIB initiative. The United Kingdom, Germany, France and Italy announced in the past week that they would join the bank, dismissing concerns by the U.S about its capacity to abide by international lending standards for the environment, labor rights and financial transparency. China established the bank last year and put up most of its initial 50 billion US dollars in capital with their eyes set on financing construction of roads and other infrastructure in the region. Pakistan held its first Republic Day parade in seven years full of flag-waving pomp and aerial military expertise in a symbolic show of strength months after a militant attack on a school that killed 132 children. The parade was held amid tight security. No military parades had been held since 2008 following an escalation in the military's conflict with the Pakistani Taliban. Pakistan Day commemorates March 23, 1940 when the Muslim League demanded the establishment of separate states to protect Muslims in the then British colony of India. Hussein also said that Pakistan wants friendship with India and was hoping that all issues between the two countries can be resolved successfully. The armies of the United States and South Korea held a combined live fire exercise as a part of their annual military drill. The military operation was a part of the Fall Eagle exercise which runs from March the 2nd until April the 24th. Troops of the two countries staged a live fire drill featuring a wide array of aviation, artillery, armor and infantry assets at the artillery range complex in Pocheon, about 50 kilometers northeast of Seoul. The drill includes about 300 soldiers from the US and South Korea, four American Bradley fighting vehicles, two K-200 armored vehicles and four K-1 tanks as well as 14 helicopters. Earlier this month, North Korea fired two short-range missiles off its east coast hours before the US-South Korean military exercise was scheduled to begin. North Korea regularly protests such drills, which it calls a rehearsal for war, and recently stepped up its own air, sea and ground military exercises, adding to tensions between the rival Koreas. Welcome back. And here's more from Prime Tab Asia. In a method worth celebrating, Australia throws welcome home parades to mark the end of its Afghan military operation. In Peru, at least 37 were killed and 84 injured in a devastating collision and seven killed in landslides. India takes cheating to a whole new level and the first pure electric bus will hit the streets of China. On a lighter note, a Chinese teenager created a 42-storey tower with playing cards. And finally tonight in Taiwan, a Polish cyclist set stairs climb world record. Stay on for four reports.
Australia marked the end of its military operation in Afghanistan with welcome home parades in Canberra and Sydney. The parades honoured those who served in Operation Slipper, Australia's contribution to the battle launched by the United States in response to the deadly September 11 terrorist attacks. More than 33,000 members of the Defence Force, Federal Police and Public Service were deployed to Afghanistan and the Middle East. 41 Australian Defence Force personnel were killed and 261 wounded during that military campaign. However, about 400 Australian troops remain in Afghanistan, playing advisory role to the Afghan military. At least 37 people were killed and more than 84 were injured when three buses and a truck collided on Peru's main coastal highway. The most critically injured were flown by a helicopter to Lima from the scene in Huarme, some 200 miles north of the capital. Police say one of the buses strayed into the oncoming lane and slammed head-on into the first of the other two buses. The truck then ploughed into the wreckage. Survivors said it took emergency crews about three hours to reach the scene, according to local media reports. The government sent five medical specialists to Huarme to help the small clinic there to care for the injured. It was Peru's deadliest road accident since October 2013, when 51 people were killed near Cusco when an overloaded truck fell into a ravine. On top of that, a powerful avalanche of mud and rocks killed at least seven people, several missing, and destroyed more than 60 homes in a Peruvian town. The landslide and floods came after torrential rains pounded the town of Chosica, 47 kilometers east of the capital, Lima. Boulders loosed by two hours of heavy rain smashed through brick walls and floodwaters carried vehicles, animals and furniture through Choisica streets. Officials said the mudslide blocked and damaged major roads that linked the capital to the centre of the country. Residents asked authorities to send heavy equipment to clear the wreckage. In 1987, mudslide in Choisica killed 64 people. Peru's weather service predicts heavy coastal rains through the rest of March. Cheating during exams in India is on a completely different level. Parents and friends are all helping Indian students to cheat. Bihar's education minister has admitted that there is a problem, but says it is simply too widespread for the government to handle. Men passing pieces of paper with answers written on them to a student taking the test. They are not the only one. Many families are also breaking the rules to help teenagers succeed in the school leaving exams. Copying is rampant as more than 1.4 million students were taking the test in Bihar state last week. A superintendent at one high school denies that cheating is happening. He said if students cheat, they will not be able to progress in life and no such thing is happening in his centre. Cheating has been on the rise since the state offered rewards of about 160 US dollars to lower caste students who are able to get about half of the answers right. The electric bus, the first of its kind in China, features the longest drive range of more than 100 kilometers on one single charge and a passenger capacity of 143 almost two times of the capacity of a traditional bus. An 18-metre-long pure electric bus is undergoing a road test in Beijing before it starts to hit the city streets. According to Beijing Public Transport Holdings Limited, the bus will serve passengers on the number 57 bus route which travels between Sihoi and who found Kyaut Road East after the two-day test. 
Director of Department of Technology of Beijing Public Transport Holdings Limited, Zhao Ruliang said it saves energy and has zero emissions. It travels at a lower cost than a bus powered by oil. In addition, the bus was manufactured with a new technology that can reduce the noise in passenger compartments by 6 to 8 decibels when it travels on the streets. The Beijing Public Transport Holdings Limited will put five more pure electric buses into service next year. On a lighter note, a 13-year-old Chinese teenager created a 42-story tower measuring 2.42 meters with 1,200 freestanding playing cards. Zhao Wanqiang, the creator from southwest China's Chongqing municipality, said the tower was designed by himself and the playing cards were stacked without glue or tape. In Zhao's view, the display is the most satisfactory work he has made to date. The teenager became interested in building houses of cards two years ago and has already built at least 80 multi-story buildings in different shapes. The teenager's dream is to break the Guinness World Records set by an American architect, Brian Berg, who built a replica of the Venetian Macau Resort Hotel in 2010. The record holder used 218,792 cards to complete the structure, which measured 10.5 metres long and 3 metres tall. Three, two, one, go! And finally, a Polish stun cyclist climbed over 3,000 steps on two wheels in Taipei to set a new world record for the most stairs climbed at one time. Christian Herber climbed 3,139 stairs of Taipei 101, one of the tallest buildings in the world, in 2 hours and 12 minutes without using any additional support, breaking the previous world record. The building has only 2,046 stairs, so once he reached the top level, Herber had to take the elevator to the ground floor and climb up the stairs again. The last official record was also by Herba and stood at 2,755 steps and was achieved last month at the Eureka Tower in Melbourne, Australia. Herba's performance was recorded on camera and will be sent to Guinness World Records for verification. Herba, 33, a high school teacher from the city of Zezau, has already climbed nine other skyscrapers around the world. And that concludes this week's edition of the Primetime Asia. Till we meet again with more interesting scenes and events next week. To watch more on Primetime Asia portal video, you can visit our website at www.rtbnews.rtb.gov.bn. Assalamu alaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. Wishing you all a pleasant week ahead and good night.